How's it going guys? Texas Man here. I hope that you guys are all having a wonderful day. If you guys would, give this video a thumbs up if you guys do really enjoy it. Subscribe if you guys have not already. Also, do me the biggest favor of all. Hit that bell notification button. That way you guys don't miss out on a single video or streaming on the channel. And you guys have subscribed. Thank you guys for doing so. We are getting closer to that 500 subscriber mark. Thank you guys that are brand new subscribers. If you guys are brand new, make sure you guys go over Constantly check out the playlist area. It's constantly being refreshed with new playlists. You guys can also check out older playlists. You guys can watch older content. I've been doing this since 2019. So there's a bunch of content here on the channel for you guys to watch and enjoy. And also make sure you guys check back regularly at the community area. There will be either notifications of what's happening on the channel, what's coming out, and sometimes just fun polls for you to take part in. And in this video, we're going to be discussing positives and negatives, talking about the newest Tom Cruise movie, Mission Impossible Dead Reckoning Part 1. This is the part one of two for the grand finale of the Mission Impossible franchise. And to be completely honest with you guys, I never thought we were going to get anything past Mission Impossible 6. Get it? MI6. <laughs> I never thought we were going to get anything past Mission Impossible 6. Fallout, I thought, honestly... That's a good conclusion to the character, a good conclusion to the story, and to the universe. Um, I will say, now that I've seen, at the time of creating this video, me seeing all seven Mission Impossible movies, I still love Mission Impossible 3. I still love that. It's got the grit, it's got the good action, it's got humor, it's got some really dark moments. I really enjoyed the villain. I enjoyed the concept of arms dealing and, you know, nuclear weapons at the time before, you know, Rogue Nation and Fallout kind of went into that territory and now Dead Reckoning is kind of following the same thing. MI3 kind of saved the franchise because I will admit Mission Impossible 2. It's a horrible movie. Not just a bad Mission Impossible movie. It's just a bad movie in general with all that stop motion um, action sequences. It's horrifying. I've seen it twice. Once uh, when I got it on DVD. And another time I was doing a marathon of all of them leading up to uh, Mission Impossible Ghost Protocol. And... I still hate the second one. I've seen it twice, and I really don't enjoy watching it. And to be honest, you can skip it. <laughs> the second one really doesn't add anything to the franchise. Like, you literally can watch one, skip two, watch three, and you're really not missing a thing. You're, you're really not. Um, you can't do that when it comes to Mission Impossible 4, 5, and 6, because it feels like an actual trilogy arc when it comes to characters and plot. Uh, so, what does Dead Reckoning Part 1 do well? Well, first of all, fantastic, fantastic action sequences. I, I loved every single moment of it. Yeah, it kind of feels like a combination of stuff we've seen before. There's a scene, there's a car chase scene, and it's hilarious, don't get me wrong. It, I, I, I was laughing. There's a moment where I just burst into laughter. And I think the rest of the audience was doing it too. They just weren't as loud as me. <laughs> um, but it was funny. But there is a moment where the car chase sequence goes into a roundabout. And the protagonist's car doesn't have any doors on their vehicle. And I'm just like, I feel like I've seen this recently. John Wick 4? Yeah. <laughs> so, I, I get they were shot near at the same time. And they're not trying to rip off each other. But... It just feels like, okay, I've seen this before recently. It's like, okay, same writer maybe? <laughs> um, film has great characters. It ties in with all past six films. Uh, there's characters even from the very first movie from back in the 80s that return in this film. So it does feel like an actual conclusion where they're tying up loose ends of characters and plots. And I really enjoyed that. And not only that, but it's an enjoyable watch. Uh, there's very little CGI. You can tell 
what's practical and whatnot. Like when Tom Cruise does the whole bike stunt um, off the mountain, you can tell that it's not a mountain. It, it, it looks like a ramp. They just CGI'd it to make it look like a mountain, but you can tell it's a ramp. And another thing is this movie, it has nearly the exact same formula of Indiana Jones 5 in the Dial of Destruction. However, this film has female characters that do not constantly overshadow the male characters because reasons. There are no main male characters that are just old and they're dumbasses and they can't do anything like they were able to do in their past adventures. No, I'm sorry. Tom Cruise in this movie versus Harrison Ford in Dial of Destruction, um, completely different. And it works. And I, I, I just, this is what Dial of Destiny, <laughs> the Dial of Destiny, um, should have been. I don't know, I've been calling Indiana Jones 5 the Dial of Destruction because it was a destruction to the entire franchise. I know what I'm saying. I, I'm not miss saying what the name of the movie is. I, just to clear that up. <laughs> um, but seriously, if you've seen Indiana Jones 5 and you've seen this movie, you know exactly what I'm talking about when it comes to respecting legacy characters. And that's what this movie does, still. We're seven movies into a franchise and it can still understand how to make female characters feel powerful without them constantly degrading and berating and cutting down their male counterparts. And they did a great job. And the chemistry between Tom Cruise and uh, uh, Haley Atwell, who's famous for being Agent Carter within the MCU, their their chemistry, I'm just like, okay, got a new another love story. Awesome. Their chemistry worked really well together. Really enjoyed it. Um, we get a bunch of awesome other new characters within the film. Um, the actress that plays Mantis from the Marvel Cinematic Universe, especially from Guardians of the Galaxy. She's in here as some sort of uh, assassin. Uh, unfortunately, she doesn't get that much to do. She's just assassin 101. You don't get any backstory to her or whatever. And she ends up dying in the finale of this film. Uh, and I just thought it was kind of a waste of a character and a waste of uh, good talent from the actress. Like, she did a great job. But she really wasn't given all that much to do. And she kind of just felt like another fluff character, to be honest. Like, if you removed her character from the movie, you probably would have cut out 20 minutes. And that's going to lead into the fact that the film is just way too long. <laughs> I'll get to that later. Uh, great new characters. Lots of luck moments. Like, there are, like, at the beginning of the film, they're looking for this, you know, you got this key MacGuffin device thing to shut down this... AI rogue entity machine thing and it's just lucky that like the keys are still on person they were able to find them somehow six months later and that the people that had the keys on them weren't eaten by sharks or anything I just 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 things like that just happen by pure luck and I think it's just really weird um, lastly for positives, I think the villain not being human and it actually being AI, it's kind of scary because it's everywhere and nowhere at the same time. And I like the fact that, you know, it's not, oh no, look at me, I've got my butt, my finger pressed on a button that's going to end the world. I'm like, I'm happy that they went somewhere different instead of retreading old ground that they've done for the past six movies, basically. So I enjoyed that. Uh, negatives, like I just discussed Recently, uh, the film's way too long. The film's almost three hours long. <laughs> and it feels like a three-hour movie. If part two is almost as long as this, oh my goodness, why? why? Why are we living in a society where in order for a movie to be good, it needs to be three hours long? Now, don't get me wrong. There are movies that I enjoy, and I'm going to enjoy watching, like Dune Part 2, that's going to be like three hours long. But it seems to be a trend within Hollywood where in order for your movie to be good, it needs to be somewhere around three hours long because we need to shove in we need to shove in as many plots and as many characters as possible for our movie to sell tickets. It just doesn't work like that. It doesn't work well. Um, the plot also is not very original. 
Like, the plot is basically, let's stop an rogue AI. <laughs> and it plays out, the plot throughout the movie plays out very similar to past rogue AI movies. Like, Terminator 2 Judgment Day. Like, watch Terminator 2 Judgment Day, the extended edition, of course. And then watch this movie. And come back to me in the comment section and tell me how similar they are. Because they are so, so similar. And it's just, it, it boggles my mind that they couldn't come up with something a little more original. It, like, I get understanding, the I understand the fact that, um, y you know, uh, you're wanting to do an AI thing. And I appreciate that, but like, make it something different that we haven't seen f from the past 60 years. Uh, lastly, it can be confusing to keep track of of who's on whose side because there's constant backstabbing um you've got so you've got in this movie you've got tons of different groups and it can be confusing to keep track of who's where and doing what and why so you've got uh ethan hunt slash time cruises group you've got the imf that's hunting him down you've got the imf director hunting him down you've got the head of the intelligence group hunting him down you have um, the Mantis assassin character hunting. You've got... So that's five. You've got um, some assassin that's working specifically for the rogue AI called the Entity. And he's doing his things. You've got the police throughout the entire movie chasing you down. You've got uh, the Russians chasing you down. You've got Interpol chasing you down. I'm trying to make sure I don't forget anybody. Uh, you've got uh, those bounty hunters. <laughs> the bounty there's bounty hunters at the beginning of the movie, so that's ten. You, you see my problem? There's like ten different groups all in this movie. No wonder the thing's almost three hours long. <laughs> Sheesh. So keeping track of who's on whose side and who's where and who's backstabbing who and why. It is a lot to process, and it's just, I mean, even the credits, like the opening credits with the theme song, it just go flying. Like, if you remember, <clears throat> watch Mission Impossible 3 or Ghost Protocol's introduction for the credits, much slower. It takes like a minute and a half. This one, the, the intro credits with the theme song, it takes like 15 seconds, and it's done. It's like, they just fly. And, uh, I don't know, I did not... <sighs> I did not hate this movie, but I didn't enjoy it as much as I think um, I was going to. It's not a bad movie. Still go ahead and check it out. Um, I'm going to give it an 8 out of 10. Uh, 8 out of 10. I, I wanted to give this like a 9, but there's just... It's way too long. Constant backstabbing and a lack of originality when it comes to the plot. Uh, I'm still, It's still a fun movie. There's no... Um, sex, there's no nudity, there's no, um, wokeness messaging agenda in it. It's just a fun action film, and I enjoy it for that. Um, but those three things kind of do hurt the movie, in my opinion. So, 8 out of 10 for Mission Impossible, Dead Reckoning Part 1. Look, for more, look forward to more videos and streams coming out soon. I will be, uh, seeing Oppenheimer, so I'll have that video out for you guys very soon. Look, for, look forward to that review coming out soon. Have a great day, guys.